In this era of patient-centered health care, patients play a central role in making clinical decisions, such as choosing between radiotherapy and surgical resection in breast cancer. However, unless patients have relevant information, they might select inappropriate treatments. Thus, it is important to consider what information is necessary for patients to make correct decisions. Here are five kinds of information often used to measure the benefits of treatment. Patients can easily understand most of these. For example, suppose chemotherapy costs a patient an additional $10,000 a month. Such information can be easily understood by both the patient and doctor, but the doctor cannot fully appreciate its impact on the patient's household economy. Although the doctor may judge the benefit of therapy by its ability to delay the time to relapse or death from the disease, the patient might rather spend the money for the relief of preterminal suffering or save it for the patient's beloved family. Silvestri et al. interviewed 81 patients who had previously received chemotherapy for stage 3 or 4 non-small cell lung cancer. Given that they hypothetically have metastatic cancer, they were asked to value the trade-off between the life-prolonging effects of chemotherapy versus its toxicities. One of the questions was whether the patients would opt to receive cisplatin-based chemotherapy if it would prolong their lives by three months. Only 18, 22%, chose this treatment. When asked whether they would choose chemotherapy if it would reduce symptoms without prolonging life, 55 patients, 68%, selected therapy. Thus, the prolonging of survival time by cancer therapy does not necessarily provide a benefit that patients value. To solve this dilemma, we need a better instrument for measuring the long-term impact of various treatments. Generally, Survival benefit is evaluated by one of these five measures. Traditionally, five-year survival has been the most commonly used measure of the benefits of treatment. This measure is the proportion of patients surviving five years, and it is easily understood by both doctors and patients. It is based on the assumption that if patients survive for five years, they are most likely cured. In fact, as shown here, death often occurs after five years. Conversely, other causes such as traffic accidents or heart attack may kill patients before five years, making five-year survival an unreliable measure of cure. Bogue tackled this problem in 1949 when he estimated the cure rate using the disease-specific survival curve. The overall survival curve is affected by deaths from any cause, while the disease-specific curve treats patients who die of causes other than the cancer under study as withdrawn at the time of death. Thus, if the curve levels off over time in parallel to the time axis, the distance between these two parallel lines represents the cure rate. The median survival time is the time required for 50% of the patients to die. In other words, the time when the survival rate becomes 0.5. The mean survival time is the average of the survival times of all those who have died. It is equal to the area under the overall Kaplan-Meier survival curve, or AUC. This is because the Kaplan-Meier curve can be constructed by piling up the horizontal stipple bars in increasing order each representing patient survival length. The mean is often larger than the median because of a few patients who have an especially long survival time. In 1977, 10 eminent biostatisticians contributed an informative article about randomized controlled trials to the British Journal of Cancer. They recommended the log rank test as the best measure of the difference between survival curves since it takes into account the overall structure of the two curves being compared. On the other hand, they regarded median survival time as very unreliable and considered average survival time to be even worse. The log rank test is closely associated with the hazard ratio. 
Both are based on the proportional hazards model, which Sir D. R. Cox proposed in 1972, thus achieving a breakthrough in survival analysis. To explain the proportional hazards, we will illustrate the hazard and then the hazard ratio step by step. The hazard is a fraction that is similar to the usual mortality. Both fractions differ only in their denominators, as the numerators of both are the number of deaths at that point. If no patients are withdrawn alive before the study period, the denominator of usual mortality is the number of subjects at the start of the trial, whereas the de denominator of the hazard is the number of subjects still alive at the point under examination. Suppose two automobile manufacturers, A and B, competed in an obstacle race, each starting with 10 cars. Those cars suffering accidents are shown as standing on their heads. The durability of the cars may be simply measured as the proportion of cars completing the full course, i.e., 2 out of 10 of group A and 5 of 10 of group B, indicating that group B cars are more durable. This is equal to the survival rate. Another method of measuring durability is more complicated. It compares the hazard at each obstacle. At the first obstacle, group A experienced a hazard of 4 out of 10, while group B had a hazard of 2 out of 10, so that the hazard ratio at this point is 4 out of 10 divided by 2 out of 10 equals 2. Likewise, the hazard ratio at the second point is 4 out of 6 divided by 3 out of 8 equals 1.8. As a result, group A has about a two times higher risk of accident. Cox selected the hazard ratio as a measure of the difference in survival between groups. He postulated that at any point in time the hazard ratio of one group relative to the other group is constant. He further extended his model with the regression analysis by estimating the effects of covariates on the hazard ratio. His model has been supported by the majority of biostatisticians and is most commonly used in randomized controlled trials. He was knighted for his great contributions to statistics. It is usually agreed that in a randomized controlled trial comparing two treatments such as chemotherapy and control, a hazard ratio of 0 0.78 represents an estimated 22 percent relative reduction in the risk of an event. In other words, 22% of the patients in the controlled group could be cured by chemotherapy. However, the observed results did not agree with this estimation. In fact, even the example Cox gave in his original paper showed a conflicting result. His example was drawn from the randomized controlled trial published by Freerich et al. from 1959 to 1960. 21 pairs of patients with acute leukemia who had achieved remission with steroid were randomized to either 6 mercaptopurine 6MP or placebo. Their times to relapse were compared. The results using the Cox model revealed a highly significant improvement in survival with 6MP compared to control. The hazard ratio was about 0.22 indicating that about 78% of relapse in the control group could be prevented by 6MP. However, longer-term observation revealed that almost all patients treated with 6MP eventually died from relapse. Clearly, a hazard ratio significantly lower than 1 is not always associated with an increased cure rate. This fact is confirmed by sequential changes in the pattern of overall survival curves. In this slide, a total of 10 survival curves are plotted for patients with acute lymphoblastic leukemia who had been treated in different years and by different chemotherapeutic regimens. Before 1960, as shown in the left panel, the survival curves shifted rightwards with time, 
but all curves fell nearly to zero, indicating that death is delayed but not prevented by chemotherapy, even with 6MP. By contrast, after 1961, the tails of the curves shifted progressively upwards with time in parallel to the time axis. This upward movement shows that the cure rate had increased, very likely due to the progress in combination chemotherapy, including vinca alkaloid, etc. In 1949, 23 years before publication of the Cox model, Professor Jack Bogue proposed a parametric model with a cured fraction. In order to more accurately estimate the proportion of patients cured, he, incur he incorporated the cure rate into his model as the principal parameter. He assumed that a fraction C of patients are cured of the disease. He further assumed that log failure times of uncured patients follow a normal distribution with mean M and variance S2, S squared, unless they succumb to other causes. In the era when computers were not available, he estimated the value of these three parameters for several cancers, such as uterine and breast cancers, using the maximum likelihood method. This required him to perform thousands of computations using three instruments, a pencil, a pad of paper, and a slide rule. Bogue was neither a doctor nor statistician, but a radiation physicist. Nevertheless, he knew very well what information patients would like to know. When diagnosed with cancer, patients often ask, how great is my chance of being cured? If the patients are told that the disease is difficult to cure, the common question they ask is, how long will I survive if I'm not cured? The answers to these two questions are found in the two parameters of the Bogue model. The cure rate is of particular importance since whether cure is achieved or not makes a great difference in both the patient's quality of life and their survival benefits. If cured, patients are saved from physical and mental suffering caused by the disease and could gain additional decades of life. For cured children, the average gain may exceed 50 years. We applied the Bogue model to the Freelich 6MP data. The results showed that the hypothesis that the cure rate C did not differ between the 6MP and control groups could not be rejected. Thus, 6MP is unlikely to cure the disease. However, there is a highly significant difference in failure time. 6MP increases time to relapse by a factor of 4, or from a median of 6 weeks to 25 weeks. If the time axis is transformed into a logarithmic scale, the mechanism by which 6MP improved survival becomes clearer. It causes a nearly parallel shift of its survival curve to the right, i.e., it prolongs the median failure time but does not increase the cure rate. The curative and palliative treatments exhibit two different patterns of survival curve and both can be reproduced by the Bogue model. Here is another example of RCT in which the Cox and Bogue models gave opposite results. Using data gathered from 1989 to 1993, the Dutch Gastric Cancer Group compared the results of limited lymph node dissection, D1, with more extensive dissection, D2, in a total of 711 patients with gastric adenocarcinoma who underwent curative resection. The operations were performed under the guidance of a Japanese specialist. The results showed that D2 dissection was significantly associated with increased hospital mortality, high morbidity, and longer hospital stays. But there was no significant difference in five-year survival or hazard between the two groups. The cumulative risk of relapse was not significantly different either. The authors concluded that their results do not support the routine use of D2 resection advocated by Japanese surgeons. Even in Japan, 
These results caused a fierce debate over lymph node dissection. Generally, Japanese biostatisticians and some younger surgeons favored less extensive lymphadenectomy because such analysis is done in line with evidence-based medicine. Conversely, most Japanese surgeons based on their clinical experience feared that such insufficient lymph node clearance might worsen the survival of gastric cancer patients. Thanks to Professor Van de Velde, we had the chance to reanalyze the same data using the Bogue model. The results showed that the parametric curves of the two groups separate with time and the cure rate after D2 dissection is significantly higher than after D1 dissection with a difference of 11.5%. In 2010, after a median follow-up of 15 years, the Dutch group reported different results. D1 dissection was associated with a significantly higher local regional relapse and disease-related death rates than D2 dissection. They recommended D2 lymphadenectomy for patients with resectable cancer. The death rates were 48% and 37%, respectively, with a difference of 11% which is close to what we estimated 10 years before using the Bogue model. Although the log rank test and the Cox model are still commonly used in survival analysis, Cox himself has acknowledged the limitations of his model in his comment on our editorial published in Surgical Oncology. He stated that his model is unlikely to be effective for studying long-term survival and to provide clinicians and patients with prognostic information specific to that patient. Gamel noted that the log rank test may be less sensitive to treatment that enhances cure than that which delays relapse, leading clinicians to select palliative therapy which may delay relapse over curative therapy. Such a result can be reproduced by a simulation study based on the Bogue model. Two groups of 500 patients each were simulated. One group received palliative treatment while the other received curative treatment. When follow-up was terminated at two years, the green palliative group clearly has a higher survival rate than the red curative group, showing a highly significant difference with their hazard ratio of 0.55. However, when follow-up is extended to 20 years, the survival rates for palliative to curative treatment are reversed. There is no significant difference between them using the conventional analysis. Thus, if the RCT ends with limited follow-up, the less effective treatment may be favored and given to many patients, benefiting only pharmaceutical companies. There is a Japanese video game in which monsters are knocked down before they hide. Here is a blue monster successfully killed and a red monster reviving from a swoon. Such monsters may be compared to cancers treated by curative versus palliative treatments. If cancer is eradicated by curative treatment, the hazard curve is reduced to zero, but it will rise again if the cancer revives. Suppose the hazard curve is unimodal. Its peak is moved to the right by the palliative treatment and the hazard curve of the palliative treatment usually intersects the control hazard curve. As a result, the hazard ratio changes with follow-up time and the proportional hazards assumption will not hold. According to K, the hazard ratio is not only difficult to explain, but its use and interpretation confuse both statisticians and non-statisticians. Friedemann is also opposed to the use of the hazard model in RCT. It must be borne in mind, however, that the Bogue model also suffers from certain limitations. For example, to estimate the cure rate, a large number of patients must be followed up for a prolonged period of time. Although Bogue did not estimate the effects of prognostic covariates on survival, Gamel extended the Bogue model to regression analysis so that effects on survival of treatment, demographic data, 
pathological and laboratory findings and other parameters can be evaluated. Admittedly, elderly and high-risk patients may die from other causes earlier than predicted from the disease-specific survival curve. To solve this difficulty, the overall survival rate, or OA, is estimated by combining the Bogue model with survival data from the sex and age-matched general population. The mean survival time is then calculated as the area under the overall survival curve, or AUC. These circles represent 50 groups of gastric cancer patients who underwent operations in Cancer Institute Hospital Tokyo and were followed up for 30 to 50 years. They were classified into groups by such factors as age, sex, and operative and pathological findings. The mean survival was predicted for each group and compared with the observed values. Although the predicted values are slightly biased toward overestimation, they are closely correlated with the observed values. Note that such mean survivals are obtained by extrapolation of the disease-specific survival curve. In the right panel of this slide, the overall survival curves are predicted at five years for different age groups of gastric cancer patients using both the Bogue model and the competing independent risk model. These were then compared with the observed curves. Although in the left panel, additional data were required to predict the overall survival curves using the Cox model, the curves predicted by the Bogue model were more closely correlated with the observed data. It is important to note that predicting events beyond observed data has long served many branches of sciences. An excellent, an excellent example is meteorology, where great success has been achieved in predicting the courses of hurricanes. If the follow-up time and the number of patients are sufficient, extrapolation beyond the available data may be justified. This slide shows the failure time distribution of gastric cancer patients operated on in Cancer Institute Hospital Tokyo from 1946 to 1966. The red curves represent log normal distribution fitted to the data. The red curves represent log normal distribution fitted to the data. Some biostatisticians suspect that failure times Z follow other distributions such as Weeble or Gamma. The log normal hazard curve differs from the latter in that the hazard begins at zero, rises to the peak, and then gradually declines. Such a unimodal pattern is only seen in log normal and log logistic curves. Since imminently fatal cases are not enrolled in the trial, it is unlikely that death occurs at time zero with hazard greater than zero. Survival analysis almost always involves some assumption or model. The results of the analysis may differ widely depending on what model is used, even though the analysis in, is in line with evidence-based medicine. If the Bogue model had been used rather than the Cox model, which fails to distinguish between curative and palliative treatments, cancer patients might have been treated by more effective methods. The validity and usefulness of the model should not be checked by biostatisticians alone. Patients and clinicians also should participate in the assessment of the model.